going to uh, resume from where I left off. I was uh, discussing with you the uh, Russian Revolution uh, of 1905, uh, and that is, as I mentioned to you, a prelude to the two revolutions of 1917, uh, the February Revolution and the October Revolution of 1917. But let me, let me just once again reiterate a couple of things uh, before I move on to, uh, to, to 1917. So, so uh, recall that what I mentioned to you was that in the late 19th century, you, you do have a considerable expansion of uh, industrialization in Russia. Uh, you have the Trans-Siberian Railway. Uh, and uh, you will recall, of course, from my discussion that there had been a war in 1905 uh, between Russia and Japan, which uh, led to a crushing defeat uh, for Russia. And, and we, we discussed very briefly the implications of this war uh, in Asia, where uh, Asians, uh, Vietnamese, Japanese, of course, uh, Indians, Chinese, um, a great many other people, all of them celebrated this as a kind of indication of the revival of uh, what you might call uh, uh, you know, the dawn of a new Asia in some sense of the term, right? Uh, the aspirations for, for freedom and all of that, but the supposition that now a European power could actually be defeated. Of course, in Russia, the implications were exactly the opposite because it led to a sense of despair. Uh, and as I mentioned to you in the late 19th century, uh, the reforms that had been instituted were, were extremely marginal. They had led to some changes for the working class um, and for peasants, but you still had an autocratic regime. So what you're going to see, beginning with the defeat of Russia in 1905, is agitations by liberals, peasants, urban workers. Um, and the Tsar is going to woo the liberals by establishing a parliament which is called the Duma, D-U-M-A, the Duma. Uh, the, 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 uh, there are certain reforms that are announced for the peasantry. They could buy and, land, uh, buy and sell land a bit more freely. Um, and they gain greater freedom from what used to be redemption payments. So this is a system that went back to uh, the 19th century, right? Uh, and this is, of course, partially also an attempt to increase agricultural productivity. But what's happening is that the strikes are actually increasing. The volume of these strikes is really increasing dramatically. Uh, in other words, there is extraordinary uh, unrest, not just in the countryside, but now we're talking about the urban uh, proletariat. Um, and uh, even though the Tsar had uh, in initiated the Duma, he, he, he ensures that the Duma, that is this parliament, doesn't really have uh, uh, the right to really interfere with his powers. In other words, it remains an autocratic system, right? Um, and the protections that are guaranteed to people tend to be really, if I may put it this way, on paper. So that's the situation that we're really speaking about. Um, there's going to be a constitution in, in 1906, so this is part of the, part of the uh, uh, attempt to introduce reforms along with the parliament is to introduce a new constitution. Um, but you shouldn't be fooled by the word constitution because uh, we know that even Nazi Germany uh, had a constitution. Uh, lots of autocratic and totalitarian systems still have a constitution. The question has to do with what is the nature of the constitution and how do states actually adhere or not adhere uh, to a constitution, right? So effectively, the Tsar remains in complete power. That's what we're really speaking about. And if you look at the slides that I'm going to show you now, so, you know, on the eve of the, of the Petrograd Revolution, that is a revolution of February 1917, you have 85% of the people are really still peasants, so it's still a predominantly agricultural society. Um, and uh, this 85% own 50% uh, of the land, and you've got 3% of the uh, uh, population is nobles, and they own 50% of the land. Uh, so uh, you can see, obviously, inequality is a glaring problem. Um, uh, and of course, this, in a sense, should make you reflect upon, uh, if I may put it this way, the inequalities that we have even today, because the proportions that I'm giving you here uh, you know that there have been figures that have been released which point to the fact that 15 people in the world today own approximately 50% of the wealth, right? If you look at the 15 billionaires, uh, beginning with Bezos and you know, Gates and all of that. Uh, so the question of inequality, which has come to the fore, is a question that obviously remains down to the present day. Um, 
On the eve of World War I, on the eve of World War I, Russia, which has 75% more population than the United States, has only 10% of the energy consumption of the United States. Uh, its population is 250% greater than the population of Germany, but it has only 30% of the energy consumption of Germany. Uh, and its population is four times greater than that of Britain, but it has only 25% of the energy consumption of Britain. So the ratio there would be 16 to 1, right? If it's four times greater but population, but only one-fourth of the energy consumption levels. And that, again, indicates to you that even though industrialization had taken place uh, in Russia, uh, it was still considerably lagging behind. Uh, the place where it had actually able to make the greatest gains was certainly in the expansion of railway mileage, and that is one reason why, of course, you have the Trans-Siberian Railway, right? So this is uh, Russia on the eve of the, the revolution of 1917. You can speak about what is sometimes called a double crisis, a social crisis, that is you have considerable peasant indebtedness, uh, you have hunger on the land, um, and you have a political crisis. Uh, absolutism means, of course, uh, the autocratic rule of, uh, of the Tsar, Nicholas II. Uh, you have a constitution, but really it's a paper constitution. You don't have freedom of speech. You have a parliament that's extremely weak, reforms that have not been implemented, and you don't really have an intelligentsia that is able to be part of civil society. I think that that's always critical. That is, you have a ruling, you have a, you have a, a, a what you might call an intellectual class of the word that's used is intelligentsia, but they don't really partake of civil society. Right? So they have been isolated, they've been marginalized, and we saw, of course, that in the late 1880s, beginning in the late 1880s, that one of the, one of, uh, one of the fundamental advances, if one wants to use that word, uh, in Russian society is the invention of new methods uh, of uh, what you might call political redressal, one of which was, of course, political assassination and anarchism. All right? Um, and now, of course, I mean, 1917, we're in the thick of World War I, which we will have to address separately. So we've got a number of trajectories going here simultaneously. One of them is, of course, the Russian Revolution. One of them is World War I. Uh, and one of them is what's happening with uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but I want, to, I want to finish my, my, my explanation of the events leading to the Great Bolshevik Revolution and end and with some thoughts on, uh, on uh, Lenin uh, and, and what he stood for. Uh, but what you're going to have is you're going to have a large number of Russians who are going to be drafted. Four million people are drafted from the towns, uh, and that's equivalent to about 27 to 45 percent of the labor force. Uh, there's going to be an imposition of martial law in July 1915. Uh, real wages are down because wages have been fixed for a period of time. They haven't really gone up. Uh, and one of the things that the Tsar is going to do is that he's going to prohibit strikes. Uh, the obvious reason for that was that particularly when the country goes to war, and the same thing happens in World War II in countries such as the United States, um, uh, the Soviet Union, and Britain, is that, the, uh, that under those conditions, usually strikes are prohibited, particularly because they may have adverse consequences for such things as munitions uh, industries, right? Uh, and the Bolsheviks, that is the communists, are going to be actually outlawed. You have considerable food shortages, which had been happening for a period of time, uh, but under conditions of war, they are going to be aggravated because as a general rule, and certainly this is the case here as a general rule, uh, during a situation, sh situation of a war, you have food supplies always channeled to soldiers first before they are channeled to anyone else. Uh, I mean, the most dramatic example of that uh, is uh, 1943, uh, where you have a great famine uh, in Bengal, uh, and as recent scholarship has established indubitably, I think without the shadow of a doubt, uh, uh, this famine was induced not by shortages as such, but by the fact that large food supplies were actually being sent to allied forces, for example, in Australia. Uh, right? So uh, uh, th th this is, as I said, uh, 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 you know, something that has been uh, established, I think, um, without a shadow of a doubt, namely that you know there are always there, there were food shortages in, in Russia, but these four food shortages get considerably aggravated. All right, uh, and so these so these are the circumstances that are going to lead to the onset of the first revolution, which is uh, from the Bolshevik or the communist point of view, 
it is uh, a bourgeois revolution. We're talking about now the February Revolution of 1917. You have a very, very small document, very small primary text, uh, uh, which has to do uh, with that. Uh, this revolution, the onset of that is in late February. Um, and uh, in, in October, of course, you're going to have the Bolsheviks coming into power and removing uh, what they described as uh, the bourgeois leaders of the revolution of 1917, all right? Uh, now, the consequences of the 1917 revolution, um, uh, of the, I'm talking about the Petrograd revolution before I move to the Bolshevik revolution, is that Nicholas II is going to step down, uh, that is the Tsar, is going to step down uh, under pressure from his uh, generals. So in other words, a revolution brings an end to the monarchy, but the military elites and the s political elites, the social elites, are still interested in the restoration of some kind of social order. So the Tsar has gone, but if I may put it this way, you know, you think about the French Revolution of 1789, you recall the circumstances that after the terror and all of that, there's going to eventually be a reaction. Right? So what you're talking about here is, again, a reaction of a sort, uh, except that this is going to be really, really quite short-lived. Uh, the removal of the Tsar is going to encourage borderland nationalities, and in order to understand that, you have to think, look at this uh, slide over here for a moment. So I'm, you're, you're, this is what we're looking at here now is post-October 1917, right? The formation of what is the Union the USSR, the Soviet Union, officially the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Sometimes we forget the official name. And why was it called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics? Because all of these are what you might describe as the borderland nationalities. Uh, and one of the things that Lenin is going to be greatly concerned with is what is called the nationalities question, right? That what is, what is the relationship of all of the people living in these Soviet Socialist Republics uh, to Russia itself, uh, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics attempted to consolidate them. But this is all post-1920, 1921. What we're speaking about here at the moment, in 1917, I'm just showing you this slide, is that when I'm talking about, about uh, various groups on the borders who are now seeking freedom, remember from the rule of the Tsar, they are going to declare their independence, and then eventually they're going to get absorbed uh, into the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics or the Soviet Union, right? Uh, but now let's step back for a second once again to October 1917. So what we're going to have find in October 1917 is the ascendancy of the Bolsheviks, uh, of uh, going the opposite direction, sorry, of, uh, of Lenin. Um, and I want to say a few words about Lenin um, uh, before, and then I will come back to him again and look at one particular document uh, that I think is, gives a, a, a very uh, interesting illustration of what are the ways in which he tried to advance as he thought it, some of the ideas um, of Marx. So, you know, Lenin and his family had been involved in anti-Zarist politics for some time. In fact, Lenin's uh, older brother uh, was implicated in a plot to assassinate the Tsar in 1887. And so he's, he's part of a conspiracy, as it's described by the, by the Tsarist government. Uh, he's going to be caught and he's going to be executed. Um, Lenin is going to continue to live on in Russia at that point in time, but eventually he's going to go into exile. Uh, and, and when he leads the October 1917 revolution, he's coming back to Russia from a fairly long period of, of exile, all right? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, one of the ways in which you might want to think about um, Lenin is to think about uh, a, a person who certainly cast himself as a revolutionary leader and accordingly came up with a certain theory about what was a place of what he called a revolutionary vanguard uh, in, in leading um, an insurrection and creating a new society. But he's, he's a very charismatic a person in many ways, and, and there's actually a considerable uh, difference of opinion in, in the scholarship about how to assess him, uh, because uh, you know the diehard uh, the diehard communists have long held to the view uh, that what happens in the Soviet Union, uh, and I'm speaking here about the dictatorship of the state eventually, uh, and the genocides that are going to be committed by a totalitarian system. Uh, there are some who hold to the view that. 
that Lenin is not the person who's really responsible for that because he himself had been stripped of power uh, and we know that he's going to die uh, not too many years after the, after the revolution. Um, uh, but uh, uh, without entering into this particular debate, uh, I think what we need to try to understand is uh, the course of the revolution very, very briefly uh, and what is the place uh, of Lenin uh, in trying to articulate a certain theory of communism. So February 1917 to October 1917, you have, just to reiterate, you, what you have is you have a very cold winter. You have, as I said, intense food and also fuel shortages. You have a large number of strikes, even though strikes had been prohibited by the Tsar. And that's once again an indication of the fact that the Tsarist government had essentially lost control, right? Uh, the Tsar himself tries to set an example um, by going to the front. Uh, uh, the, and you have to remember that this is an era of warfare where it was still possible and desirable for political leaders to actually go to the front themselves. I mean, nowadays, of course, most wars, in a sense, are fought by remote control. It's like the use of drones, uh, you, know, um, and, 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 you know, the presidency under which uh, drone warfare became um, the fundamental way of trying to target uh, people was, of course, the Barack Obama presidency. Um, as has been documented by a great many people, right? But this is the period, 1917 here, we are talking about the Tsar himself goes to the front. Um, they're, also ex they're also mounting Russian losses uh, at the front. And here again, once again, there's a link with World War II because um, even though, of course, World War II has been cast uh, in a popular fashion as the story of the triumph of uh, British resilience aided by the Americans uh, and the triumph over German evil, uh, we have to remember uh, that the country which suffered by far the greatest number of losses in World War II was Russia, by far. All right? And that has to do with, of, of course, the Nazi invasion uh, of the Soviet Union uh, and the long drawn out battles in the brutal winters um, and the fact that, that in an autocratic system, human lives are very often expendable. Right? So you have to keep these things in mind. Um, and there is, of course, as I've already suggested in passing, a kind of an uh, economic collapse. Now when we move into October of 1917, who are the major players, very briefly? So you've got the radical, who are the Bolsheviks? These are the radical socialists. Uh, you have the Petrograd Soviet, so that is, the revolution of February 1917, you have the moderate socialists. Um, you have, of course, the masses, as they're called. We can then aggregate them into different groups, such as the soldiers, the peasants, uh, the workers. You have a man called Alexander Kerensky, who is the head of the provisional government uh, that comes into power in February 1917. And you have the commander in chief of the Russian army, who is going to attempt a coup representing the right wing. In other words, you know, when the Tsar abdicates, he's going to try to bring in the military and have, uh, if I may put it this way, a military rule, right? These are, these are the major players. And within the Bolsheviks, of course, you have a number of uh, theorists. You have Lenin, you have Trotsky, people like that, all right? So what does the ascendancy of L Lenin signify? The first, it signifies the end of a dynasty, um, uh, the, uh, the abdication of Nicholas II. Uh, the, Lenin goes against the general socialist current, by which I mean that he rejects the government that had come into place, the provisional government that had come into place in February 1917, because he doesn't see this government as adequately voicing the views of the radical Bolsheviks, right? Uh, and he's going to then issue what I call the April Thesis, which I don't really have time to elaborate upon here, but these have to do with both his conception of the revolution and his conception of what is the most desirable steps that need to be taken. Um, the slogan that is current at that time is bread, peace, land. So he supports this. This becomes the slogan which epitomizes the revolution. Uh, and bread, peace, land, it, each of these terms in turn refers to the peasants, the soldiers, uh, and the workers. And what you're going to then have is you're going to have the Red Guards, the Revolutionary Guards, they're going to seize Petrograd in October 1917. And that is going to, of course, initiate uh, the revolution um, uh, of which uh, Lenin is going to be uh, the head. Uh, 
what were the reasons for there is going to be a civil war? I mean, I am gr massively simplifying an extraordinarily complex story, right? Um, for example, uh, you know, everything that led to the Bolshevik Revolution, I mean, we have just seen it in capsule form. Uh, and even after Lenin and the Bolsheviks assume power, there's going to be a civil war, a brutal civil war uh, between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, uh, that is to say between the moderates and, and, and the radicals. Uh, and this civil war is going to go on until, until 1920. Um, and here again, there is room for a very general reflection here, which is that many revolutions are always compromised at the outset. They're compromised partially because in many situations you have a civil war. Right? Uh, uh, this, is, this happened in, in, uh, in nationalist liberation movements in Africa, um, in Algeria, uh, for example. Right? You, you, have, you have a civil war and this makes it very difficult to actually resuscitate the nationalist program or nationalist uh, agenda. All right? Uh, but, but we do have to speak about a Bolshevik triumph because, of course, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union is going to establish uh, its dictatorship, its ascendancy, right? So you have a crisis that had been precipitated. The crisis is the crisis of World War I. It's a crisis of nationalities breaking away. It's, it's an economic crisis, um, and it's a political crisis. Um, and <coughs> certainly from the Bolshevik stand up standpoint, None of the other parties was capable of offering what you might describe as political, effective political leadership. Um, and one of the things that the Bolsheviks are able to do is they're able to seize upon this popular discontent, which is embodied in the slogan uh, that I've given to you. All right. Now, what is it that Lenin is going to stand for? I want to encapsulate it in two or three minutes, if I can. All right. And in particular. There is a piece that has been given to you. It's called The Tasks of the Proletariat, the transition from capitalism to communism. Okay? But you can first think of a few key words. Let me give you a few key words in which you can start thinking about Lenin and the agenda of the Communist Party. One, the idea of doctrinal purity. And this, incidentally, uh, uh, you, you know, I, I wish I could get into some of the details. You know, in, in India, for example, uh, there are over 50 communist parties, over 50. Okay, and, and their differences with each other are on these minute points of doctrine, which they blow up. You know, they think it's like the end of the world if their particular agenda isn't followed down to the dot. Right? So this idea of doctrinal purity has been a long-standing obsession in Marxist circles. Uh, they may not be happy with this characterization, but I, I can tell you if you just look at the debates within Marxist circles, uh, one comes very quickly to that realization that this idea still uh, holds true. All right? Secondly, the idea of disciplined revolutionary cells. Um, and, and we're going to find that some anti-colonial movements, Algeria being a classic example, classic example, right, of these revolutionary cells which are very disciplinary, uh, and very often, by the way, the whole idea was that these cells would know nothing about all the other cells, so that if one cell was captured, it wouldn't compromise the whole revolution, you know, all right? Uh, if, you've ever, if you've never seen a film called The Battle of Algiers, I recommend it very, very highly to you. All right, the Battle of Algiers, where you again have a little bit sense of this idea of revolutionary cells, although that's not fundamentally what the film is really about. All right, but revolutionary cells, so each of them led, led by, and this leads me to the third key word, this idea of a revolutionary vanguard. Right? It's not enough to have the masses. You know, it's very easy to pick up a banner, to chant slogans, all of that. Lenin was quite firmly of the view that these masses had to be led by a vanguard. And this was the task of the great revolutionary leaders. So, they, so there's no question of spontaneity and all of that. You know, sometimes people think of 
uh, these movements have a great deal of spontaneity. You know, it's people who are disaffected, who are now coming to the fore. Well, yes, there may be an element of that, but Lenin was quite certain in his own mind that what you really needed was you needed this idea of uh, a vanguard. And then, the other, and, and then you have the cadres, you know, the, the masses within that who are going to be led, right? Um, and again, there are interesting ways in which you can think about it. There's this Italian filmmaker, um, uh, Piero Paolo Pasolini, uh, extraordinary filmmaker who himself was assassinated, Marxist filmmaker, and he makes a fantastic film um, about Christ uh, called The Gospel According to St. Matthew. But what does he do? He gives a Lenin-like interpretation to Christ. So Christ is not, you know, the shepherd leading his flock. No, no, he's a revolutionary vanguard like Lenin, you know, right? And he's, he's urging the masses of Palestine, uh, what was in Palestine, to become part of his flock. And that, that's the interpretation. So it was, so Lenin becomes, Lenin is not just, if I may put it this way, he's, a, he's not just a figure, a political figure, a revolutionary figure, he's a trope. He's a trope, he's an idea for many people, moving on into the 20s and beyond into our own times, right? Now what does he argue in this small piece? Uh, well, and uh, the collected works of Lenin run into 30, 40, 50 volumes. But, but this small piece that I gave to you, an extract really, the task of the proletariat, transition from capitalism to communism. So what is a democracy, what is capitalism? C capitalism is, from Delin's standpoint here, in that short excerpt that he's given you, it's, he's describing capitalism as, a, as an economic system, which is congruent with a political system called a democracy. And under capitalism, democracy is only for a minority. Right? It's really effectively for the property classes, for slave owners, for slave owners. Right? That's how he describes it. So you have that stage. Now, when you have a revolution, you're going to have a revolutionary transition to what will eventually become communism. But it's this state of transition that is crucial for Lenin. Because it is during this state of transition that you need to establish the dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship of the proletariat is synonymous with the dictatorship of the state, because the state is now owned, so to speak, by the proletariat. And in this state of transition, Lenin argues the oppression of a majority, which is to say, all the bourgeoisie, okay? Their oppression by what used to be the oppressed classes, that is, the workers, is from his standpoint not just desirable, it's necessary. So, so in this state of transition, in this state of transition, you're going to have oppression, but the oppression has now been flipped. It's no longer the oppression cast by what used to be the property classes over the workers, it's going to be the other way around, right? But Lenin's view is that this is still transitional because eventually you're, this is going to lead to what he describes as a pure state. And that pure state is really communism. Because what is communism? It's a, it's a political condition under which the state ceases to exist. Right? And it's very important to understand that because there is this common sense reading that we have of communism, right? For example, the view that prevails in the American political establishment that communism is actually nothing else than a system under which the state owns, manages everything, right? For example, the state is the only property holder because, you know, in common parlance, one of the ways in which we view communism is to view it as a political system under which private ownership of property is not permitted, right? That would be the most common sense reading that we have of the state of communism. And then you have a, a totalitarian system in which the state is supreme. Well, actually, according to Lenin, in communism, there is no state. So what, what is viewed by, for example, by the American political establishment as being communism is from Lenin's standpoint, the transitional state. 
right? It's a transition from capitalism to communism, all right? So this is essentially what he is describing in this document. And in this transitional state, the state itself is actually the apparatus for the suppression of those who had been part of the oppressive mechanism. You know, the property owners, the slave owners, the capitalists, whatever word or phrase you want to use to describe them, all right? And we're not here now looking at the aftermath going into the 20s and 30s, but what you're going to have is by the early 1920s, you know, the Civil War is going to come to an end, and what you're going to have is the consolidation of the dictatorship what of really the Communist Party. It's the dictatorship of the Communist Party, you know? Uh, and, of course, then leading into the, into the late 1920s and 1930s, um, a, a totalitarian system which is going to have extraordinarily adverse and genocidal consequences for a great many people, all right? Now, um, I want to, want to look at uh, something else that is transpiring. Before we move on, which will happen really, I'm going to spend 20, 25 minutes on, on, on uh, Wednesday. Um, there's no class on Monday, it's a university holiday uh, on World War I, but I want to wrap up uh, my discussion of the events and circumstances surrounding World War I by looking at another set of developments, uh, and these developments have to do with uh, the Ottoman Empire, all right? And what's happening with the Ottoman Empire uh, and what is the nature of what is called the Arab Revolt, all right? So the Ottoman Empire, as I had described to you very briefly um, the other day, and I'd given you an anecdote from a book by Mark Mazover, uh, is, is an empire which is a collection of many nationalities. And you recall that you had the Crimean War. The Crimean War was one, one uh, instance of where uh, you can see attempts to break away from the stranglehold of this empire, uh, beginning, for example, with the Greek Wars of Independence, right? Um, and I, I think what Nehru says is actually quite instructive because as he points out, uh, it's not as though um, the, it, it's not as though that the resistance to the Ottomans by the British or the French or the, or, you know, the, the, uh, 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 what, what will event, that if you look at the, the, the Crimean War, you know, the British and the French are going to eventually uh, uh, side uh, with the Ottomans um, against Russia, right? But what, 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 what we're really looking at here is really the following. He's suggesting that there are these nationalities that you have here, that the European powers are interested in exploiting these nationalities for their own purposes. And he gives the illustration of the Armenians. Now, I, I, uh, I, I was particularly interested in what he had to say about that because uh, I'm sure, as many of you know, um, there is a genocide against the Armenians uh, in the second decade uh, during the period, uh, actually, of World War I. Uh, and, and in Turkey, this still remains a highly contentious uh, issue. The official Turkish position is not to acknowledge uh, the Armenian genocide. And it's also worthwhile remembering that Hitler, when he was thinking of what he was going to do with the Jews, so he has this very infamous pronouncement where he says that, because he was asked by some of, uh, some of the people working with him, well, what makes you think you can get away with, with this if you want to do it? And, he, he, and, and you know what he said? He said, well, who even remembers what happened to the Armenians? Right? That's what he's saying in the 1930s. Right? So, th so that's why I'm particularly interested in what Nehru has to say, because this is his quotation. Uh, this is a quotation from his Glimpses of World History. So here he's speaking about the European powers. Quote, they also used the Armenians as a tool to hammer and weaken the Ottoman Empire. And hence the repeated conflicts between the Turkish government and the Armenians resulting in bloody massacres. These Armenians were exploited and used for propaganda purposes by the great powers. But after the World War, when there was no further use for them, they were left to their own fate, end quote. And I think that this is a very apt characterization of what happened to the Armenians. But my interest here is not just the Armenians, but 
we're trying to understand that you have this empire, there are many nationalities there, and it's starting to fragment. It's starting to fragment, and, it, and this fragmentation is being encouraged by the European powers for their own reasons. That's really what I want to establish, all right? And so if you look over here, so this is, this is the, you know, the, this is a, a, a slide that shows the, uh, the, um, uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, and it shows the losses uh, in successive phases, which parts broke away, you know, okay? And so, you know, the slide will be made available to you, and you can study it uh, in, in much uh, greater uh, detail. Uh, here, now, here's another slide which now just gives you some idea of the relationship of the Ottoman Empire uh, by, the, by the time of its decline, because, of course, this portion here that you see here, Greece, all of this, all of this would have been part of the empire um, at, at one point, all right? Now, um, l let me uh, uh, set up the discussion by introducing um, the politics of uh, the second decade uh, of the 20th century, you know, and what is called the Great Arab uh, Awakening. Uh, and once again, you know, it, it becomes unavoidable when you, when you read about all of this during the period of World War I, and then uh, again, my mind jumps a hundred years later to, you know, the, the, the great Arab Spring. Remember, I mean, you know, six, seven years ago, um, uh, it all started with, uh, what was it, a tea seller or a flower seller, uh, uh, right, uh, in the Maghreb, in, um, um, I think it was in Tunisia, if I remember correctly, right? So uh, it's that kind of story. Um, and I'm going to recommend a book uh, which uh, I recall reading 30 years ago. I mean, it reads like a novel. It's so superbly written. Um, and it's kind of an account of what really transpired. It's by George Antonius, uh, and it's called The Great Arab Awakening. I and mean, this is really a wonderful narrative account. I mean, of course, there's contemporary scholarship which disputes some of the arguments there, but it gives you some sense of how events really uh, flowed. Uh, let me put it to you this way. There was not, no love loss between the Arabs and the Turks for various kinds of reasons. Um, and I think this is important to remember because just because they're all Muslims, well, it doesn't mean that there was some kind of unified front over there, you know. And the nationalities question is always, is always barging in, if, all right? Um, and the Arabs are going to take their time to wake up from this Turkish dominance. Uh, as Nehru describes it very briefly, you have a kind of a literary intellectual renaissance that begins in Syria uh, in the 1860s. Uh, uh, and there was one demand, of course, which was consistently voiced, uh, and that, voice, that demand was that the holy places, Mecca and Medina, yeah, should be transferred from the Ottoman Sultan, Sultan to an Arab power. Right? Now, when we move into the second decade, um, we're going to find, of course, recall who are the major powers at this point, Britain and France. They're the major imperial powers. Spain is no longer a factor. Germany is not much of a factor in this part of the world. We know that, that there are portions of Africa that Germany has now taken into possession. What is German Southwest Africa? Some portions in German East Africa, right? But Germany is not much of a factor as such, not as an imperial power in this part uh, of, of, of the world. Uh, so there's this, there's this person, he's going to be encouraged um, uh, by the British, his name is uh, Sharif Hussein of Mecca, and he's going to be actually tantalized with thoughts of being able to lead a great um, uh, Arab kingdom, even becoming the caliph uh, in, in some ways. Uh, so they're going to support his rebellion um, against the, the Ottomans. And um, um, uh, the, the uh, war is going to end with, as I pointed out to you, when I said the war, I'm talking about World War I, it's, it's going to end with uh, the dismemberment of all the major empires in that region, including the Russian Empire. Um, of course, you have a new kind of Russian Empire. Uh, if, you, if you think of the Soviet Union as creating a new kind of empire in a way, but, but the old Russian Empire had collapsed because uh, the Tsar uh, uh, had, uh, had abdicated, uh, and, we had, and of course it was the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, uh, and uh, Austria uh, is going to uh, suffer defeat, so the austro habsburg Empire is going to collapse, and then you have the, the Ottoman Empire as well. All right? Now, let me introduce one further element here. And again, I'm just introducing it here without 
really considering all its implications down to the present day, right? And what is that? It's the Balfour Declaration of 1917. And this man, Arthur Balfour, would have been completely lost to history. He would have been a footnote, but for this Balfour Declaration of 1917. Who is he? Arthur Balfour. He's a foreign secretary. And in a nutshell, what, what is a declaration? That he commits Britain to supporting demands for a Jewish national home in Palestine. Okay? But the way I put it to you makes it sound like, well, it's a settled deal. No, it's not a settled deal. So, for example, in 1939, you have what is called a white paper. I mean, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the phrase white paper, but white paper is uh, a, an official uh, policy document um, issued, uh, in this case, by the British government. Uh, there were white papers released by uh, the, the British and other countries as well on different occasions. Um, so the White Paper of 1939, so that's 22 years after the Balfour Declaration, um, actually shows a considerable sensitivity to Palestinian demands. Um, it holds out that the promise that the British would withdraw from the Balfour Declaration and place limits on Jewish immigration into Palestine. And so one of the, the, the great story that you have to think about if you're really thinking about the creation of Israel and all of that uh, and the conflict that continues down to the present day, you have to really think about the 20s and 30s because the Jewish population of Palestine was very small. And you have to understand the fact that there is immigration that is being permitted, uh, which is going to obviously change the demographic composition because if you want to lay claim to a place, you have to first change its demographic composition. And this is not you know, just the evil genius of Israel, no. Uh, th this is how states typically act. I mean, I'll give you a very different illustration once again, because we have to think about tropes, not just nations and chronologies. What is happening in Tibet, for example? Well, what's happening in Tibet for the last 60 years is an, a deliberate policy by the Chinese state, okay? By the PRC, the People's Republic of China, to bring in Han Chinese into Tibet and slowly change the demographic composition. Because if you can actually change the demographic composition, you can simply say to the Tibet Tibetans, well, you're not even a majority in your own homeland. You know, right? And that's exactly what the PRC has been doing. So this is what you might describe as a form of re-territorialization, right? You take the territory and you re-territorialize it by changing its demographic composition. And that's what's happening in Palestine in the 20s, 30s, and all of that. But the white paper of 1939 is, I'm saying to you, uh, a document which seems to suggest that even though the British had issued the Balfour Declaration where the British commit themselves to a national home for, uh, for the Jews in Palestine, the white paper of 1939 seems to suggest that the British are actually open to reversing that and placing limits. Uh, on Jewish immigration. And it's astounding that this white paper in 1939, uh, this white paper is issued in 1939 because, of course, this was at a time when the position of the Jews uh, in Western Europe was starting to become exceedingly precarious, right? I mean, the crystal, the crystal knock had already occurred the year before, the night of shattered glass when there was this huge pogrom against um, the Jews in Germany and, and neighboring Austria. Right? So, so uh, think of that, right? So what are, we, what are we talking about now? What we're talking about is we're talking about the Sharif um, um, of Mecca, Sharif Hussein of Mecca, uh, who's, been, who's been given promises that he can instigate uh, a revolt against the Ottomans and he'll be supported by the British. You have the Balfour Declaration of 1917, all right? Those are the circumstances. And what's going to transpire is too detailed to get into, but I want to sort of give you the aftermath now. So this is 1917. The Ottoman Empire is going to start to disintegrate in the fullest sense of the term uh, at the end of the war. Uh, and what the European powers are going to do is they're going to establish what is called a mandate system. So if you, if you look at this slide over here, 
uh, and again, you'll, you, you'll be able to see it in much greater detail. It'll give you some sense of the breakdown. Uh, and here you see what is called the mandate system. So now in order to understand the mandate system, what we have to go back to is the end of World War I, which we still haven't really looked at. We have started to look at related aspects of it, right? Um, but at the end of World War I, uh, the League of Nations uh, is going to come into place. Right? The League of Nations is not going to be very effective as we know, uh, and those are partly the circumstances under which uh, World War II will eventually take place. But the League of Nations instituted what was called the mandate system. And the mandate system is this idea that there are these territories, right, which are not really fit to govern themselves. They're not fit to govern themselves. So they must be placed under the mandate. There's also sometimes a word that is used, although technically it has a slightly different meaning, what's called the trusteeship system, right? That, that, that uh, and you have to think of, you have to think of the way in which um, uh, we think of schools. What are schools? You have ever heard of the expression in loco parentis, in place of the parents, right? Okay. That these states are like children. So they have to be placed in the hands of adults, that is to say the great imperial powers, who will govern these until such time, whenever that may be, until such time as these people show themselves fit to govern themselves. Right? That's one way in which you can think of it. Of course, the Euro European powers simply said they were doing this for the sake of introducing more efficient machineries of administration. Uh, Right? That, th that's going to be the fundamental you know, argument. Uh, and so the mandate system is going to come into place, and so you have a British mandate that's going to be established in Iraq, and you're going to have a British mandate in Palestine. This will continue, of course, for some period of time there, and you have a French mandate um, in Syria. All right? Uh, and, and you know, all these parts that we're seeing here where the cursor is moving, this, for example, would all have been part of the Ottoman Empire. Right? But one of the consequences, as I said, of the war was the dismemberment of this empire. Now, the, the reading that you had from Nehru looks in particular um, at Syria. Okay? The, the first portion of that reading looks at Syria. And I want to just take a, a couple of minutes to, to look at what happens uh, in Syria. Because as Nehru is going to point out, you know, there's going to be Shortly after the establishment of the French mandate in Syria, there's going to be uh, a war of resistance, a national war of independence. Uh, but one of, the things that the, one of the things that the French did uh, was they actually carved up Syria. They carved up Syria into different parts. You know. So there is what is called Alexandretta, which is the portion adjoining Turkey. Um, it's largely Turkish speaking. Uh, then you have the Alawis. Who, who are largely Muslims and Shias. And by the way, you know, Syria's present government for some many decades has been ruled by the Alawis. They are the elites there, right? Um, uh, and then you have Lebanon and Beirut, right? Uh, on the western coast and near the Lebanon mountains, a majority of the population was Maronites. And French gave them a special status to win them over against the Syrian Arabs. And here... We have to use that phrase, however cliched it might be, divide and rule. This has been a long-term strategy of colonial powers. Right? And you can see it being used okay, in a place like Syria. And effectively, what, what, what the most interesting thing that he's pointing out um, is a number of things. Uh, one is that the Syrian war of independence, and remember Syria is a French mandate. What do they invoke? They invoke the French Revolution. They invoke the great documents, the rights of the citizen, right? And the rights of man. And I think this is, of course, supremely ironical because the French are the dominant colonial power. There's a war of independence here now. 
and these nationalist aspirations are being voiced by people who are invoking actually the very documents that created the French Republic. Right? So what what is what transpires here, and of course eventually it's going to be, you know, the, the outcome in these places is not going to be very good. And you, you could say that it isn't very good down to the present day in, in many ways. Um, but one reason why it's useful to look at it even as briefly as I have is to also understand that these divisions were in many respects created by colonial regimes and their history goes back to this point in time you know because you know what the popular representation is you know these Muslims all fighting each other God knows why you know Right, this area is just prone to this kind of conflict. Well, not necessarily. Right? There is a history, and that colonial history takes us back to the early part of the 1900s. Okay, we're going to stop here. And in my lecture on Wednesday, I'm going to take about 20, 25 minutes to go over um, World War I and its implications. We're also going to look at some propaganda posters, um, and that will pretty much bring us up to schedule. All right?